Okay. Um, our current question for ecology and evolutionary biologists is which ecological and evolutionary processes shape in general a micro insect association as well pathogen insect association. So today I'm going to drive through a little bit background about host micro association, my study model again, the theoretical and analytical approach that we use and how we infer the history of the associations, uh, some results on cophylogenetic analysis and conclusions. So to contextualize the importance of my study model, let's start with the proportion of the, des the described diversity on Earth. We know that half of, uh, um, of known described species are insects. In fact, half of them are, are beavers, and then uh, that about a thousand of insect plants associations have been documented in the global um, database, the global biotic interaction database, and we also know that plant and insects have been evolving together for over 400 million of years. And another interesting thing is that the microbes may actually play an important role in facilitating or manipulating plant-insect interaction. So as this is something that we already know, has been documented that um, for at least not really big microorganisms, uh, they may actually trigger changes in their host um, and they may determine like you know, expansion or contraction of the diet, uh, the number of hosts they are associated with, uh, with eventual uh, some epidemiological or evolutionary outcomes. And this is an example for the in, uh, insect interaction system. Actually, I'm focusing on uh, the tripartite interaction system, which actually is, uh, has um, three components. Uh, for my study model, we have a plant that is considered the final host, uh, or the primary host, and then we have emitra insects that are vector, and then we have phycoplasmas that you already learned are a group of bacteria in the class of molecules. But now let's uh, look into uh, phycoplasma, uh, into the phylogeny. I'm providing here like um, the Tree of Life published in 2016, and then you can see here this clay on the top. Uh, this is the final mycoplasma data. Uh, formerly Tenericutes, and uh, in, in 2020 we provided the first uh, time tree for phytoplasmas. We included uh, a bunch of uh, closely related um, lineages in the class of molecules, and then you have these nice monophyletic lineages in green, which is phytoplasmas, uh, you know, is monophyletic, and uh, uh, we included all representative reference strains for phytoplasmas. Some facts, um, uh, we know phytoplasma are strictly transmitted by nicotinal insects and they uh, are obligate, so they live exclusively on plant phloem and insect tissue only. They may cause severe plant diseases, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but most importantly, they are able to uh, elude host defense, uh, exploding metabolic pathways of the host, and they induce behavioral and uh, phenotypic and physiological changes in the host. Um, long time ago, um, on Sandel, in 1972, they proposed, uh, indeed, the host manipulation hypothesis. And I generated a, me a metaphor for phytoplasma, which is this picture here, which is the struggle of pleasure. And this is actually an extension of the struggle of, for survival published from Darwin. Darwin uh, has been using a lot of metaphor because it's easy to to get the, the message. But actually behind, there is this theory formulated, which is a manipulation hypothesis. So according to this metaphor, phytoplasma are able to actually manipulate uh, most their functional traits. Uh, for example, for plants, uh, we know that they are strictly parasitic on plants. Uh, but we also observed a uh, virulence factor protein that may cause symptoms on plants, various symptoms and they may alter phenotype and they may affect selection, uh, um, uh, host plant selection uh, by an insect. Uh, indeed, on insect vectors, um, this is kind of um, 
uh, different from what was already presented uh, by our colleagues uh, yesterday. Uh, we actually, for Phagioplasma, noticed that uh, we have a different kind of uh, mixed effects. So someone uh, documented positive effects on insects, like kind of increasing in longevity and fecundity. Some, or someone else indeed documented a negative effect, so the contrary, decreasing in longevity, and some, some others natural effect. But anyway, there is an, an increased lymphopoe attraction that was observed and documented uh, towards for example, infected plants, which is not correlated with the symptoms like uh, situation, but is more co correlated to the, uh, with the presence or not of um, uh, phytoplasma protein effectors in the plant, expressed in the plant. So, motivation for this research is twofold. So, we actually are using a use as part approach. And the research is actually have this research has a broad impact to benefit society through proactive strategy to cope with emerging phytoplasma diseases. Uh, I'm presenting here a book that we uh, just published, and I contributed with a few chapter here. And the purpose is to provide this revolutionary perspective that we are missing uh, with this uh, story of evolution and of emerging infectious diseases in agriculture uh, in order for us to be prepared. And um, this should have broad impact, uh, hopefully. Uh, but we also have a basic ecological evolutionary uh, theory approach in order for us to uh, answer more basic question. So uh, this research eventually may offer a new perspective of microbial impact on insect evolutionary diversification. So uh, I'm going to drive you to our theoretical background and how we set up our own hypothesis. So to do that, we need to start what we have in the literature. We have two prevalent hypotheses. One is, the first one is state. Insect vectors, including leaf hopper, are thought to be all capable to carry pathogens as a result of increased pathogen fitness from being in commensal association. I call this maximum auspiciation theory. And this is mostly followed by uh, in the discipline of plant pathology. On the other hand, we have another prevalent hypothesis, but just for veterinarian science. And uh, this is actually known as maximum constitution theory. It was long known uh, since 1913. And this hypothesis states that parasites phylogeny mirrors the host phylogeny and cospeciation drive host pathogen association. Unfortunately, as postulated in this version uh, of the Buddhist parable of blind man and the elephant, the two hypotheses lead to two non necessarily true conclusions. And this is too bad, uh, and because most importantly, the two hypotheses generate the paradox. So I'm going to drive you to, into the paradox, which is first hypothesis. If insect vectors are all generalists, right? So they are living carrier rather than true host. They should be able to interact with any pathogen whatsoever. So consequently, we should observe increase increasing in host generalization with evidence of a fermental vector phytoplasma relationship regardless of the transmission mode. So we should have everything everywhere. On the other hand, if we believe in the second hypothesis, uh, the maximum cospecification theory wants that if parasites evolve towards specialization, the classical one host, one pathogen, they should avoid specialized association with their host plant. Consequently, we should observe narrowing in both plant and insects host, leading to this really host specialization and evolutionary speaking is at a dead end, so extinction. So actually the purpose is to reconcile these two hypotheses. So the research in order to reconcile uh, these two different hypotheses, we set up a couple of research questions that are fundamental. So are the vector generally generalist living carriers or they are 
two books for phytoplasmas. And the second question is, what are the evolutionary and ecological, uh, ecological processes that shape the pattern of diversification of these interactive, uh, interactive lineages? And here we are, we have, we have our own hypothesis uh, that uh, meant to reconcile the, the, the overall uh, confusion uh, based on separation in disciplines, but we thought uh, that a vector and the plasma assertion are governed by macroevolutionary mechanisms and the opportunity of new encounter um, dry, driven by historical ecological events, therefore I can bring a vector uh, true us for phytoplasmas with some event of expansion, contraction, and some events of being generalized mode rather than specialized mode. The second hypothesis is events of extinction and conspecification between phytoplasma and vector are less common than event of a switching due to the contribution of specific phylogenetic conservatisms and opportunity um, provided through host manipulation hypothesis. Therefore, we should observe rapid host expansion followed by rapid um, um, diversification events somewhere across the evolution. So to do that, I use two approach. Uh, one approach is reconstruction of ancestral traits. There is a lot of plotting phylogeny into uh, one or another of the associates. So we have a uh, kind of uh, pretty common approach. Uh, also like a kind of reconstruct the ancestral host state, uh, state reconstruction, which is something similar to um, um, ancestral um, area of range reconstruction. Uh, and then, of course, some protein-protein um, interaction study that may provide evidence for, uh, for, for uh, sorry, phylogenetic conservatisms. The second approach is much more direct, uh, more formal, if you want, but is also uh, a lot of limitation that I'm going to present to you. So this is just the, um, the world of the phylogenetic analysis, and you know there are two type of algorithm that work differently. So one is called global fit, one is called uh, event-based, but we will talk more about it later. So about the first approach, uh, I want to go very briefly because these trees have been presented during this uh, uh, conference. So you by now probably are familiar with this. Uh, so but, you know, this is the only clade uh, of plants and feeder that may eventually be associated with phytoplasmas in yellow. So uh, if we zoom in, uh, we know that in the tree provided, um, these uh, subfeeders that are eventually associated uh, with phytoplasmas are in two uh, rel relatively distantly uh, related clade. Uh, so we have this clade here, Dombokenorinca, and uh, this uh, group of Stenorinca. So um, the character that uh, define uh, the vector com competence seems to be on classes. Uh, some facts. 80% um, of phytoplasma strains are associated with are associated with Membranoidea, 16% with Furgoloidea, and 4% with Psilloidea. So let's focus on uh, the prevalent uh, group, which is Membranoidea. Um, yeah, of course, uh, Delta Cephalini are um, um, the group, the subfamily that contain. Um, the higher number of species that transmit uh, and are competent back to phytoplasmas. And uh, this is the tree from uh, Tsao et al. 2022. And uh, if we highlight the tribes that uh, actually are known to be uh, competent back to phytoplasmas, we may want to infer that vector capacity seems to be above multiple time uh, within that cephalini. And um, we are going to uh, look into some specific example, um, just focusing on one of them, which is Macrocellini and Phytoplasma in the group one, uh, which is um, um, a very widespread group all over the world and cause different type of diseases. 
So this is, as I said, uh, is the time tree for Phytoplasma that will be published in 2020. And in this cartoon, we just plot the um, potential, uh, the, the time of emergence of potential uh, uh, for phytoplasmas. Um, phytoplasma may be uh, like an history of free living bacteria earlier uh, when they emerge uh, 600 million of years ago, more or less, just uh, because we don't we didn't find any evidence of possible uh, host, um, um, a plant host or um, insect host. There may be also a possibility that they were associated to some kind of ancestor of vertebrates. This is maybe another possibility. But when we have a lot of fun here is when um, cicada emerge, spermatophyta emerge, and uh, angiosperm emerge with a lot of uh, matching um, um, uh, emergence between host and phytoplasmas. So I'm going to focus on this group, as I said, Macrocellini, uh, and uh, on group one, just as an, as an example, to show you, for example, here we have the emergence of group one, which is the phytoplasma in red here. This plate emerged 150 million years ago, and the group started leaving 35 million years ago. If you plot, the uh, same information from Macrostellini in here, they emerged 75 uh, million of years ago, according to Sawetal 2022, and then uh, they started getting sorry, in uh, 52 million of years ago. And this situation is depicted, depicted here. So on the top you have phytoplasmas, and on the bottom you have um, the, the, the host, the likely host, Macrostellini, and you, you see, you, we observe pattern that we routinely observe when there are this event of expansion and contraction due to major know, climate changing or other events that may disturb colonization versus other phenomena. And this is actually a period of stasis where uh, that we call like exploring stage where eventually, after a big change, phytoplasma may have managed to switch the hosts, and then we have this uh, period of uh, and diversification of, of phytoplasma and the, the host vector eventually, that we call exploding uh, stage. So here, uh, what I told you before, the ancestral host reconstruction. So when you think about this analysis, you just have to think about, so it was possibly then before that for obligate um, microorganisms, um, the host is the area for the parasites. So do you just replace the host with like, uh, is Macrostellini, is Asia, is the same, because it's just what it is, the, the, the micro follow the, the host. So we reconstruct the ancestral state using RASP that everyone uses, we uh, selected the the, the most important model that explains uh, basically 13 dispersal events and one event of decadence and zero events of extinction. Unfortunately, we have to use a reduced uh, phylogenetic tree for phytoplasma because to be confident with this data, we have to use just the documented uh, known association. So we cannot use potential association that we are not confident we, so we have to discard the data, this data. So this is just have to be taken carefully, right? It's just the beginning. Um, but there is a nice report that an ancestor of psychedelia may be uh, the ancestral of state, uh, state four phytoplasmas and during carboniferous, but uh, we immediately after have two major events of dispersal, which happened in 256 uh, um, million of years ago, and the other one, uh, 150 million of years ago, that uh, um, basically matched the two major events of uh, um, climate warming. And then we have several other dispersal, uh, dispersal events on the tip, and uh, one a single vicariant uh, event. So about phylogenetic conservatism, this is the last strategy that we use to infer uh, for the association, if it's true or not. Uh, but anyway, we, um, Chris, uh, uh, first hypothesized in 2013 
that vector competence may be um, associated with a character which is phylogenetic, one or more character uh, that is phylogenetic concerned. So for this reason, we run experiments. So we run protein-protein interaction experiments, and we provide um, um, evidence for uh, vector capacity being associated with molecular traits that explain for vector competence and are phylogenetic concerned. So uh, what we learn from, from the first approach is that the association appear to be evolved through different amount of colonization uh, and one amount of decadence, and that there are molecular evidence that actually link up vectors plus standard link of course, um, be considered true uh, hosts. So let's move on to the second approach, covalent analysis. We have these concepts, right? Co-evolution, we talk about co-speciation, co-divergence. Those are usually concepts that are used in the literature um, broadly, like interchangeably, uh, without reflection. And it's difficult to navigate through the literature, actually. It's difficult uh, for me. And actually, we provided a review paper where we uh, kind of try to uh, run a systematic review to understand what's going on. Uh, we learn a little, uh, at least. But what we know is that coevolution means is that what them come from two parts. So co together the one species and evolution descended with modification. The coevolution is put on the sand that we do that mutual modification. But we also know that uh, all star size uh, relationships uh, from what uh, a certain group of parasitologists have been studying include also two components in this co-speciation, which is mutual association of or congruence between phylogenies, and co-accommodation, which is mutual modification. So evolution actually is mutual descendant with or without mutual modification, with or without mutual speciation, which means it's really difficult to disentangle the intricate history of coevolution between interacting lineages because we have to take care back in time of several uh, different events that may or may be not mutual, uh, may or may be not have a, a mutual uh, cause. So uh, they, maybe they speciate at the same time, but uh, not because one uh, caused the speciation of the associate. It's complicated. But uh, we have the maximum coevolution, uh, co-speciation theory that help us to make everything simple. And actually, uh, so simple that is too much. So the assumption for this is that parasites have a narrow number of hosts and colonize more area, and over time they have this lower probability to hosts, which if this was true, by now we don't observe any more um, um, uh, emerging diseases, because if this theory is true, we should not observe the emerging diseases. If you go towards the savages, pathologists are so easy, so you don't switch, you don't have emerging diseases. Not. So they uh, also the, the, the theory tend to uh, say that uh, the specialization and also switches. So sorry, that also switches is actually a rare uh, phenomenon. So the essence of science is change, and scientific change is creative. So when there is a need or desire to make a change in an normative framework, here we are. We have metaphor that become the language of choice as Darwin. Uh, did before, and that's so funny. He did before that I love so much. So I'm kind of uh, following this path here. I'm providing this metaphor um, from a movie that I love. Uh, we have the assumption zero, maximum co-speciation, um, maximum congruence between phy phylogeny. Well, uh, everything works. Sometimes things doesn't work. So how do you explain that? Voila, we have the bad assumption one, ignore the data, or the ugly assumption two, create imaginary data. So it happened, unfortunately, and we have documented that in the literature. By the way, we have a couple of method uh, group of algorithms that uh, we used to uh, disentangle phylogeny of interacting species. 
This means that unfortunately has a lot of theoretical and computational limitation. But we still, all of us, still use it, we use it, uh, but we have to be careful, really. So uh, myself, for this presentation that I'm about to finish, I promise, uh, I use two uh, uh, global fit uh, approach, which global fit means I'm going to provide you uh, the significance of the overall uh, congruence of the, uh, of the phylogenies. So that it's up to you to decide what it is. And then we have this amazing uh, approach, which uh, is an event-based approach, which actually promise you to deliver uh, at each time back in, in the evolution uh, what is the most likely um, uh, event uh, that happened. Uh, so we have a bunch of algorithms. I choose just one, but the, the thing is that we are preparing a software for this algorithm that right now is just a written algorithm, but it will fix some problem that I'm not going to go into the detail today. Anyway, this is the results of global fit approach. What is saying basically? I'm just providing you the results for this first line, which is the data sets of competent vector and phytoplasmas. We have 74 links, and uh, the results for these two algorithms just saying, oh, you have um, a, a very significant cophylogenetic pattern going on. But then when you look into um, the results, when you look into um, the output of the analysis, you discover that only 20, uh, from 10, 20% of the links are actually congruent. All the rest is incongruent. So this may be not explained by the maximum cospeciation theory, right? So, and this is just how we look into that numbers. So those are the two uh, phylogeny. Blue is congruent. Uh, red is incongruent, and this analysis is, is amazing. I mean, it's a still global fit approach, but uh, give you uh, reconstruct you the more likely uh, congruence versus incongruence event for each node, and uh, the shade of the, the the color is just the strength of the significance. So you, you see here, so very consistent blue dots are between these two lineages. Sternal ring cap, psyllo specifically cap -psyllo. And then a uh, group 10 uh, apple proliferation uh, disease, which is very widespread in Europe. And then you have this strong uh, cophylogeny, which is not an indication of cospeciation, but quite. For all the other uh, things, here is a mess. We don't know what's going on, but uh, because it's alternating blue and, and red, we are um, assuming that there is some kind of other pattern that we have to disentangle. For this reason, we use event-based approach. Event-based approach promises us to deliver the most likely explanation. So at each node, it was a cospeciation event, it was a duplication, of switching, or linear sort sorting. This is what they have uh, postulated uh, for a long time, and this is what this algorithm do. This is the results of the Jane uh, software. So uh, to conclude, speciation were among the least uh, common events. Duplication and also switching explain a good amount of the observed incongruencies, and we have, of course, also a high number of losses and failure to diverge that actually need another algorithm to be explained properly, so but this is what it is. Conclusion. Uh, research question number one, what is in our internal association? So we think that based on the evidence collected, our caloric and learning character should be considered true host, so no maximum host manipulation hypothesis, but some kind of in the middle. Um, for phytoplasma, this is due to what we have been documenting, phylogenetic conservatism in a vector of phytoplasma interaction along um, the evolutionary history. Research question to main process. Yes, main process is, of course, duplication. Uh, failure to emerge, more likely, uh, but uh, of course it's not cross speciation. We observed that for several reasons that I don't show you here today. Because uh, we have that just for Capsilla 
Silo there and group time. Uh, but of course, more data are needed here because we, as I mentioned before, we need data from natural areas. So what these data are going to uncover, who knows? So we'll see. 